I think hopefully we've uh, referenced everybody on the faculty because I think everybody in the faculty has contributed more to talking about odontoid fractures than I have, but it's, it's such a common problem that we're going to go through it and I think really just focus on odontoid fractures more in the elderly population as opposed to the adult population, or should I say the older adult population as I'm getting older now too. Um, these are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent to what we're going to be talking about, and here, here's the problem. In 2010, there are 40 million Americans over the age of 65, and this segment of the population is growing much faster than the rest of the population, 1.5% per year versus 1% per year. So there's really, I don't know, in my center, and I think in probably most other centers, there's just an avalanche of problems that are coming our way. And I, a week certainly doesn't go by in our institution where we don't admit somebody over the age of 70 with an odontoid fracture, and usually it's two or three. So I think this is something that we're really going to have to delve into and figure out what the best way to treat them. Now, it is the most common cervical fracture in patients over the age of 70, and part of that is an anatomic region. Uh, 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 all of it really is a very anatomic region. You have, reason. You have very weak cortical bone and less uh, trabecular bone right at the base of the dens there in that zone too, and as a result, people with fairly innocuous falls are prone to a fracture through that area. Now, what we're going to be talking about primarily are type 2 odontoid fractures. We could talk about other odontoid fractures, but I, I mean really, you know, the, the type 1 is very uncommon. I've seen one or two in my career, and they've been associated with Atlanta occipital dislocation. So I think that's the take-home message for that. Type 3s, uh, more common in younger trauma population, or, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of these will heal with conservative measures, uh, either a, a halo or, or a Minerva brace, and I can get pretty good healing with a, a type 3 uh, odontoid fracture with conservative treatment. So that really leaves the type 2s that are problematic. Now, what's the mechanism of injury here? There have been a number of studies that have been done over the years. The initial studies were anatomic and cadaveric studies. And basically, the mechanism for a type 3 is slightly different than the mechanism for a type a type 2. And so the mechanism for a type 3 is extension and compression really in a straight line. And that's why you'll see these in younger patients with high-speed motor vehicle accidents. The type 2 mechanism is a little bit more of an oblique blow with compression. And that's why you'll see these older patients sitting around, you know, the, the telltale sign as you walk into the room and there's somebody with a goose egg over their eye, mm -hmm. a poor little old lady, and, and you got to look for an odontoid fracture because that's the, the oblique blow that often gives it to them. Other people have, have repeated this and said that, you know, an oblique blow, you know, the, the basically the arch acts as a sort of a hammer against the, against the dens and can fracture it off that way. This has also been repeated in finite element models. Uh, basically, this is a, a study from uh, VJ Gold's lab that's now almost 15 years old. And what they show are those fractures that are in sort of the left-hand column there are repeating the type 3 fractures. And you'll see the force is greater, i.e. the brighter signal, and the force is more into the body when you have a pure extension moment. Those are the fractures on the left. When you have this extension more than 30 degrees off the horizontal, you have less force that is required to create a fracture, and therefore you get the type 2. And so this has been repeated in a number of models now, and, and those are the mechanisms by which you get both type 2 and type 3 injuries. Now, again, looking at the microarchitecture, this is a paper that's now almost 20 years old. And what they found is that looking at a bunch of, of sort of sagittal sections, what they found was that there's about a 35% reduction in the cortical bone of these patients over the age of 70, and almost uh, more than 50% loss of the trabecular bone, as you see there in that zone too, in patients over the age of 70. As a result of this, you're more prone to fracture because you have thinner cortical bone, and you're less likely to heal because you have that tr uh, poorer trabecular pattern. So as a result, you know, you, you really have to figure out how to, how to treat these. Now, this is an example of a 66-year-old uh, gentleman that I took care of during my fellowship or residency a long time ago, a couple of decades ago. And at that stage, we often treated these conservatively. The thought was that, well, you know, since they don't really come with neurologic injuries, they can't be that unstable. But this is a case where you show that it really it is quite an unstable fracture. Take my word for it, we, we performed a CT scan, and this patient does have a type 2 odontoid fracture. And since they're not very displaced, we chose to put them in a halo. And you can see here, there's just a slight posterior displacement there. And we went ahead and, and said, well, you know, this is a reasonable, reasonable thing. Let's go ahead and mobilize the patient. Unfortunately, every day over the next five days, every time we took an x-ray, that odontoid, even with the patient in a halo, was in a different position, suggesting that even halo immobilization isn't really strong enough for these patients 
patients. And these can be really, really, really unstable fractures, even though they're not that dangerous neurologically to the patient. As a result, that's led to fairly high non-union rates and fairly high non-healing rates in older patients. Other people have looked at halo vest immobilization and found even very high mortality rates as well as, well as the high non-healing rates, up to 80% in some series. Now, this is a paper from Brown from Bob Tajan, uh, who's a, now an orthopedic shoulder surgeon down in uh, Utah. And basically what they found was that for patients who were immobilized in a halo vest, as compared to treated with a collar or even taken to the OR, their in-hospital mortality was 42% versus 21% for patients that they treated either in a collar or took to the OR. So they doubled their mortality rate when they put patients in a halo. As a result, we've sort of backed off quite a bit immobilizing these patients in halos because it's, it's, it's you know, they actually wrote one paper saying, oh, it's a death sentence to the patients. I think that might be a bit of a misnomer. But given the fact that you're really not immobilizing the patient that well and you are putting them at higher risk for mortality, I think halo vest has become somewhat passe for a lot of these fractures in older patients. Now, the older patients do not heal as well as the younger patients. And if we talk, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about odontoid screws as we go on here. You know, this is a, a great thing to do for a younger patient, that rare younger patient that you see once every five years with a type 2 odontoid fracture. But what happens in the more common scenario, the patient over the age of 60 or 70 who has an odontoid fracture? Well, Anarson was the first to point this out, and they did a case-controlled study. This was from the University of Iowa, describing type 2 <laughs> fractures. And they found a 21-fold greater risk of non-union when patients over the age of 50 were treated in a halo, suggesting not only were you putting these patients at risk, but you also weren't healing, as we've seen here in the last couple of slides. So as a result, this has led the joint section for the AANS and CNS to suggest that patients with a type 2 fracture over the age of 50 should be considered for surgery. And this was probably one of the strongest recommendations that this, this joint section made in these cervical spine guidelines. Now, there's been a lot more that's been uh, been put into the literature since, and, and this is a paper from Jens. This was a review uh, from the AO Spine North America Geriatric Odontoid Fracture Mortality Study. They reviewed 322 patients over a couple of centers. Uh, the mean age of patients that were treated operatively versus non-operatively, fairly close to the same. Non-operative treatment was associated with a higher 30-day mortality with a confidence or with a, 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 a risk ratio of three compared to um, basically operative treatment treatment. Even at a year follow-up or two-year follow-up, which was, I think, their longest follow-up, there was a trend towards greater survival in patients who had had surgery versus patients who were treated non-operatively. So it looks like surgery actually improves your mortality rate or decreases your mortality rate in these type 2 odontoid fractures. Now, of course, surgery is associated with a longer stay, seven days, ICU time, and also a need for a feeding tube. So you have to understand the collateral damage you're doing when you go ahead and operate on these patients. So it's something you really, really have to counsel patients about. Uh, Alex Vaccaro uh, followed this up. This was a, a prospectively followed a series of slightly smaller series of patients, 101 treated surgically, 58 treated non-surgically, and they looked at improved quality of life with surgery. They found that the worsening in the neck disability index was greater in patients that they treated non-surgically than in patients that they treated surgically. In other words, patients who were not treated surgically were doing worse with their, with their outcome measures. They also found a lower non-union rate in the surgical group, 5% versus 21%, something you would expect, and that the mortality rate was higher in the non-surgical patients. That's 26% versus 14% at three months. Most of these patients in these series were treated with posterior surgery, so that was a surgery of choice in this situation. Uh, but they found that actually surgery improved not only your mortality, but also your quality of life in these elderly odontoid patients. More systematic reviews have come out of, out of Jefferson. Uh, the short and long-term mortality favor surgery compared to non-operative treatment. And there's really no difference in the complications in if you look at large series of papers and, and try to do a meta-analysis on it. Now, operative treatment, what's the best way to achieve fixation in these older patients? And that, that, that 
it remains open to debate. You know, a lot of us like to do posterior fixation, but there's certainly, I come from Utah, and obviously my one of my mentors, Ron Affelbaum, was a big believer in odontoid screws. And I think there's certain benefits of direct anterior fixation. You preserve the C12 joint, you have shorter surgical times when you get somebody set up correctly, you have lower risk of vertebral artery injury, obviously, and you avoid the prone position, which can be key in some of these sicker patients. The problem is, of course, you have weaker bone and there's a tendency for these screws to toggle out. So as I say, you know, if you get that rare patient who's in their 30s who has a type 2 odontoid fracture, an odontoid <coughs> screw is a great procedure. The problem is, what do you do with those older patients? And we'll talk about that a little bit more. I think the odontoid screw, you know, you can do a lot of things with it. Again, I trained with two guys who, who you know, Jens taught me how to do it. Ron Affelbaum really refined it. These two guys were masters, and they could put two screws into a very small piece of odontoid, as you can see here, and really get stabilization and get good healing rates. Unfortunately, the rest of us aren't quite that good, and a lot of us actually use in default to one screw. And the question is, is, is one screw really as good as two in the older patient population? Ron's series of 147 patients showed he had pretty good healing rates when he used odontoid screws across all comers. He had a, a, a 147 patients, the mean age was 50 years old, most of them were type 2 odontoids. The bony fusion rate was 88% in recent fractures, and that included patients in the anatomic and non-anatomic position. You add on a number 3% for fibrous unions, and you get to almost a 90% healing rate. The problem is you couldn't do this in remote fractures, and in Ron's series, it was patients over that had been had fractures for more than six months. But if you really actually look at these patients, they either came in sort of within one or two weeks, or they had waited six months to come in. So as a result, you know, we say that if it's been going on for more than a month, or their fracture is more than a month old, I certainly won't do it odontoid screw on them. Um, they, they found that there were a lot of things that were not significant predictors of failure. Sex, age, degree of displacement, number of screws you used. But the fracture pattern was a significant risk for failure with an odontoid screw. And what he's talking about here are these fracture patterns that you see on the left, the anterior oblique. And it makes sense if you think about it. If you try to put an odontoid screw through that and lag that fracture fragment down, what's going to happen? You're going to pull that odontoid further forward and put it into a non-anatomic position. So as a result, this fracture pattern is actually something that I'll look for, even in a young patient, and often uh, uh, defer to a posterior C1, C2 fusion. Now, whether you use one or two screws, well, uh, Rick did a lot with this and said the load to failure was the same whether you used one or two screws. Other clinical series have showed the same thing. Basically, one screw is as good as two screws when you look at healing rate. External orthosis, well, the one thing that they did show also in those papers is that when you put a screw in, whether you put one or two screws in, the load to failure was only half that of the original specimen. So as a result, I'll often keep patients in an external orthosis after I put an odontoid screw in, because I'm worried it's, it's stronger than it is if you don't put something in, but it's not as strong as it was originally. Now, what we did was we looked at odontoid screws in our older populations and just try to figure out whether it works as well in these older populations. And this is using Ron's technique. We looked at stable unions, uh, stable, uh, stable fractures versus unstable fractures. And what we termed stable fractures was if you had a bony union like this, or if you had a fibrous union like this, where you clearly weren't convinced that that thing had healed, but it wasn't moving on flexion extension. And we compare those versus the obvious non-unions, things where the screw had backed out or fractured, or you could see clear movement. As a result, we had 57 patients, mean follow-up of 14 months. We did lose a lot of patients to follow-up, as you might expect in this older population. What we found is that similar numbers of patients had one or two screws, uh, one or two screws placed and had three-month follow-up. <laughs> Overall, our stability rate, either bony fusion or fibrous union, was about 80%. This compared fairly favorably to what's out there in the literature with Platzer, who showed a 12% non-union rate in the elderly. But we were pretty rigorous about how we determined fusion and union. What we did find that was actually our overall stability rate was a lot less when we only used one screw versus two screws suggesting in our series, or in our hands, that if you were going to do an older patient with an odontoid fracture, you better try to put two screws in as compared to one screw. And I think we've all seen this. You know, there was quite a rage in the, in the early 2000s and 90s. Everybody wanted to do odontoid screws. It's quite a cool procedure. But I think we've all had elderly patients fail. Forget all the other problems that can associate with it. And I think a lot of it has to do with you need, you need two screws in the older patients. The other problem with the older patients is the complication rate, 35% dysphagia rate. And I think we've all had issues with that, plus the early failures. And so as a result, I'm very reticent nowadays to go ahead and recommend odontoid screw fixation for our older population. One, because of the difficulty sometimes of placing two screws, but also this high dysphagia rate. 
So in summary, direct fixation had a stabilization rate of 80%, but you had to discuss the potential for dysphagia in these patients. Now, what we tend to do and what I tend to defer more to is posterior fixation with some sort of either transarticular screws or some sort of goal or harms construct, if you will, posteriorly. There's the efficacy of posterior C12 fixation has been started to be uh, described in the literature. Anderson did a nice comparative series where they had 100% fusion rates in posterior patients versus a 30% fusion rate in anterior screw fixation patients. Franzen published a paper now almost 10 years old where they found that the healing rate in, in those survivors from odontoid fractures was nearly 95%. They did have a high mortality rate, as, is, as has been pointed out in the literature, from these fractures. But actually, when you went ahead and fused these patients posteriorly, they had a good healing rate. And this, this has been, again, pointed out in the systematic review that's, again, from Jefferson, where they said which approach. And you can see the bars, the, the dots to the right of that line favor a posterior fusion. The dots to the left of it would favor an anterior fusion. So there was really no difference in mortality or complications, whether you chose an anterior or posterior fusion. But there was clearly a trend towards higher fusion when you went with a posterior approach, suggesting, again, that posterior approach has become much more uh, commonplace for these geriatric odontoid fractures. Well, what about, to finish up here, what about non-surgical treatment? I mean, you're going to have patients who just don't want surgery. This is a very prominent woman in our community, 87 years old. She's out hiking. She's still very active. Takes basically a ground-level fall as she slips on some slippery rocks and absolutely refuses intervention for this odontoid fracture. And so what, what does the literature tell us about this, somebody who we treat like this in a collar? Well, again, the group from Jefferson found that almost 5% of their patients who presented with a type 2 fracture had chronic fractures and presented with a neurologic deficit, suggesting these could be dangerous. There's other stuff to the counterpoint in the literature. Bob Hart looked at a series of patients from the University of Iowa, followed five patients for almost five years, and none of them developed myelopathy, even though they had four to five millimeters of movement on their flexion and extension views, suggesting you could treat these patients in a collar, get a fibrous, relatively stable union, or even a non-union, and go ahead and follow them without an evidence of myelopathy. Bob Molinari published a recent paper. This was almost 60 patients. And what he did was any patient that had less than 50% displacement, he put in a collar for six months. Those that had more than 50% displacement, he treated with a posterior fusion. There was only a 6% healing rate for those patients that were placed in a collar. But what he found was that they had improved health-related quality of life measures as measured by an NDI lower mortality and lower complication rates when he treated these patients in a collar and non-operatively. And so his conclusion was the results of his study did not demonstrate any evidence of a lower functional outcome for those patients who had mobile odontoid non-unions when they fo were followed up to two years after their injury. So again, this is a lady. What we did was we put her in a collar for a period of time, and I follow her very closely. And you can see here on flexion and extension, I think she's got what I would call a fibrous, uh, a fibrous um, uh, basically, union. I can't define that there's actually bone healing across there, but I can't define that there's any movement either. Uh, other people, more high active, like this guy who's out hunting and fishing all the time, we strongly persuaded him to go ahead and do a posterior approach. And that's what we went ahead and did. And he's back to his normal quality of life. Jim Harrop published a, a good series of treatment recommendations, and this was vetted through the, spinal, the former spinal trauma study group. They've recommended that older patients have surgery. If you're going to use non-operative treatment, there was a strong recommendation for a collar, not a halo. And if you were going to do surgery, there was a strong recommendation for a posterior approach. But that was based on, again, level four and five evidence, consensus opinion. So in summary, odontoid fractures are something that we're seeing a lot more of. You should probably recommend surgery if somebody, certainly if somebody's highly functional, but you can follow them closely with a collar if you, if, if you choose to, so long as you're telling them about the risks. If you're going to choose to do surgery, probably posterior surgery is the way to go. And I think this probably yields the best outcomes as we're seeing in the literature here. Thanks for your attention. Mm -hmm.